Looks like we are live. Hello, folks, and welcome to an episode of Danielle and myself uh, doing <laughs> a little honeycomb exploration uh, using some data that was generously donated by our friends over, over at rubygems.org and done with the help of the, uh, the lovely folks over at Fastly who provide a great integration to get the logs of what your service is doing. Uh, so, I'm Danielle Fisher. I'm a designer here at Honeycomb. And greetings from our Seattle co working space where we're beginning to uh, play with this. I thought it'd be fun to take a chance to try live debugging and play with Honeycomb and just sort of see what it's like. Uh, Liz and I found ourselves in a chat conversation a couple weeks ago playing with this data set and going, ooh, that's kind of fun, and thinking we should share it with the world. So this is uh, not quite exactly what we do in our day jobs. We normally start Honeycomb's own data, uh, analyzing what our customers are doing. But it turns out that we can look at pretty much any set of data that someone's given us and find really interesting and cool, hey, what was that? Right. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Sure. So I've gone to play.honeycomb.io, which allows you to log in and or to play with Honeycomb. No sign up required. In fact, this works perfectly in incognito mode, so you don't have to give us any of your information if you don't want. And here at play.honeycomb, we have a link here to uh, live data coming in from RubyGems. So RubyGems is an archive of gems for Ruby. When you go to query Ruby for data, it pops up. Why don't we show them the RubyGems homepage, actually? Oh, that's a fine idea. Um, Just rubygems.org. OK. I think that's that one. Yep. Hey, there it is. Good. So it's a list of gems. It's got a search feature. And ooh, let's check like how they, how they believe their status is doing right now. Okay. Yeah, that's always fun. So they think they're solid. We're probably you know, not going to disagree. I just quibble a little bit with the idea of 100% uptime. Nothing's ever 100% up, but it can be close enough. So let's see how they're really doing. Let's save that one for the SLO playthrough. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, do we want to try starting from the APM from the uh, homepage actually to see like their HTTP statuses? I bet that might work. It's not enabled here actually. Oh, um, uh, well, we should maybe fix that up at some point. We should. It sounds but like a useful now, thing to do. What we do have is things like response time broken down by cache status, which is kind of a nice starting point. So this is how much time it takes them to serve things, and it's broken down by cache status. So uh, Fastly is a content delivery network, so it's automatically caching a lot of things so in fact we can see that both the count of things that are that have a hit on their cache is much higher and also we can see that well if we compare the speeds you'll see that like the hits are all along the bottom edge and the pat and then oh where I go cache misses so this is interesting we're seeing numbers that are just way too large and the y-axis is totally blown out so I'm going to switch over to a log scale. Log time elapsed. Nice. Log time elapsed. That seems like it's more likely to yield uh, robust results. How did you do log time elapsed, Danielle? Oh, uh, log. <coughs> so right now we do that with a derived column. So right here, log time elapsed turns out to be just running through the log base 10 of that feature. Derived columns are a lightweight way of adding additional columns to your data set based on computation from other things. It's the equivalent of calculated columns in other spaces. So, wow, that looks a lot a lot nicer. You so, can actually see your data now. Right, so we can now see that as I hover these over, hits, you know, still, the vast majority of them are hitting at uh, between two and three. Now this is in microsecond, so that means those are being uh, processed in millisecond time, which is pretty impressive. What about the misses, though? Ooh, those are a lot slower. So now that we don't have the axis blown out. Right. So these I'll hover near five. So 10 to the fifth would be uh, 100,000 divided by 3,000, divided by 1,000 because it's microseconds. So, so these are still being processed pretty quickly in the tenth of a second range. Uh, there's a couple other statuses, including this interesting one of error. Ooh. So they're failing and failing slowly. That's fascinating. So when something fails, it fails more slowly. 
But I'm kind of having trouble kind of visualizing how many of these are there. Is there a log count maybe that we can use to look at about how many there are? Um, I guess oh, we'd yeah. have to uh, set it to log scale for all of them, which would be unfortunate. But let's That'll try be a that. little bit unfortunate for the other two because that's a standing bug. Okay, but yeah, so we can see, you know, roughly there are way more hits than there are uh, right. than there are errors or Couple misses. Order, right, there's two orders of magnitude more <clears throat> hits than pass or miss, and then error and hit pass, whatever that is, are floating down here in like the a couple per second. Interesting. So back to linear scale. Yeah. And let's maybe... Which ones are the slowest? Like, I'm kind of curious, like, of the ones that our cache misses, mm. right, which ones are, are faster and slower? Well, we can do that by filtering out that specific group. Okay. Seems useful. And so now we've filtered ourselves to cache status equals miss. Yep. And now as we look across this ribbon, we can sort of see some interesting... There's some yep. outliers. There's some outliers. I mean, actually, this one's really interesting to me, too. This super fast spot right here, mm. where for no obvious reason, these ones happen to take very little time. That sounds like we should do a bubble up, doesn't it? It does. So a bubble up allows us to grab some dimension and or some set of points and see how they stand out. By the way, I just want to point out, this data is real and live, and Liz and I have not rehearsed with this, so... I genuinely have no idea what we're about to learn. No, I don't either. So this bubble up is now comparing the points that are down in here against all the other data in the data set, so everything inside this two and a half hour query window. And what we can, oh, mm. so this is one particular client who, you know. It's happened. accessing the same path maybe? who did one particular request from one particular... I think this is pretty much like one person doing one thing. But then why isn't it hitting the cache, right? Like, that seems mm. to be the thing that Fastly ought to do, is if you're hitting the same URL, it should repeatedly cache it. So is it actually the same URL, for real? Uh, let's see, is IP6... Um, it's got the same body size consistently, so... Hmm. Right. I think it might... How many events is it actually? Um, Selection from 1577 samples. Okay, so there's a fair bit of data hiding under there. Hmm. Well, why don't we filter by that client IP hash then? Because if we Sounds filter great. to that client IP hash, we can go look at the raw ro rows and see what there, what's there. And also, let's see what else that user got up to. So that user had another little blip earlier at uh, 12.15. And then, and then they here. hit, and they slammed RubyGems with like 500 requests. Wow, cool. Okay, so what's in there? Or, yeah, right. we don't have traces turned on here, so it's just yeah. it's just the raw data because we don't have any info on what goes on in RubyGems backend, just in their front end logs. Exactly. And let's see. Ooh, that's not supposed to be. Their client IP is supposed to be obscured. That's a problem. We should. Uh, oh we yes, should get that it fixed. is. I'm um, so sorry about that. I th oh, I think it's maybe. Are we working with the real production data in UI Honeycomb, or is the play? It nope. Okay. So yep. Okay, we'll get that fixed. That doesn't yeah. seem right. We should probably obscure that. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think the, the search bar is like there, isn't it? Or did it go there? there it is, is. yep. Peekaboo. Okay. So, so what are they fetching? Well, so. It's a get request. So gets are cacheable. This is not like they're repeatedly posting right. or anything. From Vancouver. Um, yeah. Different header sizes, which is interesting. Oh, interesting, yeah. So what are they repeatedly fetching? Uh, different. Is it the same user agent all the way through? This one looks like most of them are the same user agent. Yeah, yeah, I think it's all the same oh. user agent. Okay, that yeah. that makes okay. sense. Um, so what is it fetching? Ooh, we can break down by URL. Let's do a breakdown by your. Let's let's break down by URL to find out right. whether, how many are are being fetched. Okay, so I'll add URL to the breakdown. Breakdown is what's more familiar in SQL land. It's as group by, and we're thinking about changing it to group by. Right, but what you're seeing... Okay. So, so the no, most these are all different. Well, that's because if you take a look... Right, so... They've all got, like, long, weird arguments afterwards. They're all checks on, like, a bucket of dependencies. 
Yep, so it's all calling the same dependency. Okay, that might explain why it's non-cacheable, right? Like if it's repeatedly asking for dependencies of a different set of, of gems, right? then it ex makes sense that it wouldn't be cacheable. And it also maybe that endpoint of getting dependencies is much faster than the rest of the RubyGems code, which is actually delivering so do we, bytes. Do we have endpoint available here? Um, um, you mean normalized endpoint? Yeah. That's an interesting question. If not, we could, uh, do you want to create a derived column? I don't have permissions on this account, too. Oh, well, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Should have thought about that before. Sorry. <laughs> well, it's okay. We'll tune we'll in next time. <laughs> tune, in, tune in next time for that. Well, this is an experiment. We may or may not do it again. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it's harder for us to be standing here next to each other in person, um, given we live in different cities. But, you know. Could be its own adventure. Try yeah. this uh, remotely. Let's see. Is request request won't have the normalized endpoint, I think. Let's try it and see what happens. Yeah. What's right, like you can never actually break anything unless you um all of our backends, which is unlikely to happen. Right? The running mm. a query doesn't doesn't generally okay. break nope, everything. Nope, these are all it these just are all gets. These are all gets. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, yeah. let's go look at something else. Like let's go look at oh. high latencies. Oh. Uh, I was wondering whether uh, the gem name or the gem version, but that's not going to help us because these were dependency checks. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and go back a couple of steps. Um, sure. Maybe doing it from our history. Oh, sounds like a good idea. Yep. So let's go. So we can actually go back and see all the queries that we've run in the past. And if we were doing this collaboratively with the team, we could see theirs too. So we this were, let's go back to cache status equals miss. Okay. There. Right before we homed on one IP address. Right. So you'd also asked about the things that were that taking were the slow. most time. Yeah. So let's say look at stuff that's over this eight times ten. Yeah. Or yeah, that seems reasonable. Ten to the eighth, I mean. So here's another bubble up. So I've just selected now all the way across everything that's taken that much time. Hmm. Again, same set of slow clients. Like one client is contributing to this. And interestingly, hitting from one city. And hitting one URL. Do you see that? Down there. So one of them is slash versions, and the other is... Uh, to the, there you go. Specs 4.8.gz. I wonder what's slow about specs 4.8.gz. Also, I'm wondering what's that. I guess that's the uh, IP address hash. No, that's no. the uh, that's the user agent. That's the user agent. So okay. people, so uh, what I'm reading that is is that when you run slash, a, um, sorry, when you when you like start up the Ruby client, I suspect it does. Oh, some it passes sort of information about what was in the command line that you ran and passes that as a user agent. Yeah, I think that's what it's doing. So that uh, person that we were looking at before, where they were they were having a bunch of really fast queries, but issuing 500 of them, that was one command invocation oh. that was invoking all of them. Okay. I think that's what that means. Cool. So, uh, but these are partic So this system is particularly slow to serve from China and particularly fast to serve from US. That's not surprising. Uh, it's not, because if you look at the Fastly map, they don't have DNS inside China. Mm. So I, do you have I guess that makes sense that even, even though we're not measuring this latency from the client, that you would still see increased latency in terms of time to deliver that last byte mm, okay. before Fastly decides, okay, it's done, it's going to send the log over. Right. So let's learn more about um, this interesting case of like slash specs. Yeah. So again, we'll filter on that. Oh, did we even... Oh, yeah. It's... Yep. Yep, it's there. You just have to hit run. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so people request this a fair bit. It Only like 50, like 20 to 50 requests per, mm, per time fair. period. Actually hover over it so we get the rate. Oh, here. Yeah, okay, so it's like, you know, between zero and three times a second. That's not that often. Right. Now, this should be a fairly consistent size. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Let's have a look at the size. The other question that's interesting to me is why is this missing the cache, right? Actually, let's find out how often it hits versus misses the cache. Oh, that is a great point. Right. So we'll... Yeah, that's a great point. So breakdown by cache status. 
because after all, it should be the case that something as simple as specs.4.8 should oh, be. Oh, okay, that seems better. Okay, so Fastly is doing its job. Right. <laughs> yeah. That... So almost always it's hitting the cache. But sometimes it has to refresh the cache or at least check that it's up to date. So now that makes sense why it's checking every two to th- you know two to three times a second, but not every time. Right. Interesting. So would we be hypothesizing then that there's like a process in there that's essentially like periodically checking whether the cache... Um, but then, that, but like, then why, is it, check? why is it that disproportionately the user that's selected to, to, hit the to, hit the, to, to miss the cache is the user oh. from China? That's, oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, isn't it? Right. So as we're kind of seeing here, right, like we're kind of going through this hypothesis loop of seeing something that looks weird and then figuring out like, hey, can right. I actually test that hypothesis to see whether that's true? So if we believe that this file, is, that this is a single file, yep. then we should also believe, therefore, that the response body is consistent or close to consistent. Yep. Look at that. Right. Wait, so what's going on with the ones that... I say, so, that's re- so that's pretty reassuring. Right? We've got this nice smooth line across here of responses that are all... They're about four meg. Right. And then we've got this whole cloud of stuff that isn't. Hmm. That seems suspicious. Um, so let's try to, for example... Grab the stuff that still has some size, because I'm willing to believe that like zeros are are know. special. Yeah, and we'll come back to those later too. Huh. So things that we selected. Okay, so I bet these are the zeros here. Yep, those the are the zeros. Content type empty. So it's saying an octave stream. Oh, is it maybe if if the client hangs up the connection before Fastly finishes delivering the content? I wonder Ooh. what it gets recorded as in terms of in terms of body size. Interesting. Because that might explain the results that we're seeing so far. Right. So the, again, the 304s are probably those zeros across the bottom. In fact, I'm going to just filter those out right now. Yeah. Because 304 means content not modified, so that makes sense. Okay. Right. You got it already. Go on with your life. Please stop, please stop asking for it. Yep. Is that content not modified? Yep. So now let's take everything that's below the uniform line that we'd expect to see. The thing about correlating thousands of points is that correlating thousands of points does take a little bit of time, like mm-hmm. not longer than you'd be willing to wait, but it is a yeah. it is a process. Oh. Hmm. Oh. Ah, oh, that makes sense. Tell me a story, Liz. The thing that's making sense here is that when you perform a get request, you're actually getting the bytes of the body. Okay. When you perform a head request, right, like you're asking for information about the thing about the mm. object living at that URL. Okay. Which means that Right, that's why you're getting seeing the head request be much smaller in size because okay. when you issue the head request, in fact, we could just hypothetically do that from a terminal, except for we don't have a terminal up in the stream. Right, right is that we could just issue a head request against that Ruby gem slash, uh, and it'll tell us how big that is. And it'll tell us how big it is, and it'll tell us you know when it was last modified. Right, and it'll cool. echo back some of the uh, headers that we sent to it back to us. Okay, let's knock out head. Yeah, let's knock out head. Ah, okay. That this is getting much more reasonable. Right now, we're seeing this much sparser yeah so in fact we can see exactly how many points are in there and it's not all that many not all that many yep right so we're doing this where you should remember across both cache statuses yep so at some point we'll need to break it down okay so at this point now we're starting to get a lot more so request accept content is our selection is heavy on Whatever this field is, they, I guess that's a request. He- that's a header field. Yep. Um, city doesn't seem to be highly variant between the two sets. They're both kind of like random noise feeling to me. I think what's interesting is over there though. Mm-hmm. Like what's happening is some people are getting a mixture of both the good size and the bad size, mm. and others are getting only the the, the weird size. You see that? Right. Yeah, I think that's but that might be because they, for example, only done one or two requests, right? So it's possible that, like, I, I do a request, it fails, I go away. You do away. it again, and then it succeeds. Right. I do yeah, a request, and it yeah. right. Okay. Well, this is the people who succeeded once. What other interesting things can we divine out of out of these weird small ones? And how many are there? Uh, so the how many are there is down here again. Um, 
232. Okay, right. so not that many. At this point, like, it could be bit, bit flips, it could be, right, like, at, at something this size, it's reasonable to expect you, you to see some variation. Exactly. What happens if we go back to uh, non-bubble-up mode and do that quick hover to find out how many of these are cache hits versus misses? Uh, sure. So if we just go back to results, that way works too. Yeah. So, okay, so the... So cache hits... Are of varying sizes, interesting. What about the, the misses? The cache misses? The cache misses are almost always served correctly, do you see that? Yeah. Okay, so what that tells me is if the cache missed, then... Or sorry, if... Or right given no, given such a low probability event, maybe the miss, there are just fewer misses in the in the uh, yeah. in, incorrect byte size range because it's a low chance of getting it. Right. Yeah. We're getting our data is getting pretty thin at this point. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. But we can also break down wow. by other things that have shown up as interesting from time to time. To let's uh, again sort of reset ourselves a couple steps. Uh, to say here. And I'd like to look, break down set by cache status. I just always find geography really interesting. So fortunately, we actually have GeoCity. Thanks to Fastly. Yeah. <coughs> and. A lot of Ashburn. Hmm, I wonder what's an Ashburn. Danielle, what do you think is an Ashburn? I actually genuinely don't know what's an Ashburn. I know you're trying for the sarcastic thing, but I'm totally failing to be your uh, straight man on this one. AWS. Oh, okay. AWS, US East 1 in Ashburn, Virginia. There you go. So, yeah, that's, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Well, by Las Vegas, Mountain View. Oh, we've lost our log time elapsed, which was so much more interesting. Okay, well that's easy enough to put back. Yeah. Oh, I see. There's a lot of cities. Yeah. It is indeed a high cardinality field. Yep. <coughs> Because there are way more cities in the world than there than your metrics provider potentially wants to uh, let you have a time series for. Fair. Then actually, instead of breaking down by GOC, which is kind of hard to see, how about, and how do you feel about switching over to a uh, country? Let's switch to country, but let's also exclude Ashburn. Like I think that it's it's okay. more interesting to look at things that are running outside of AWS than things that are running within AWS. You know. Fair enough. So let's filter for. Uh, or GeoCity is not Ashburn. When did our performance suddenly go down? Like uh, your laptop fan is running really yeah. hard. Uh, because something happened to the query builder a couple days ago that causes the data table at the bottom. When the data table at the bottom has too many strings of text, the query builder gets slow. Oh no, that sounds like a regression we should fix. It is, yeah. See, we dog food our own stuff, and that means that we find these things out. It's kind of nice. Okay. So, so, the US is a fast shape. This is not surprising, and is a majority of the traffic. And everything else is much, 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 this much is a less. Response, oh, this is a response body size, so it's actually weird. It's oh, whoops. We should have, yeah. yeah. Never mind. <laughs> there we go. Better. Although the fact that the response body size varied by country is a really interesting statement right there. Maybe they're ah. looking for different gems. So, Americans, so... Germans, Canadians, right. Irish. Ir Ireland, I bet, is, uh, is Amazon again. I bet, I bet if you search around right. in Ireland, you're going to find the uh, city that, that Amazon's data center in Ireland is in. What's interesting is that these patterns look actually surprisingly different from each other. Yeah. Yeah, that's super interesting. I mean, one of the things that is visible across all of these, especially the less crowded ones, is that there's sort of two bands, one of them floating around at 5.0, the other floating around at 2.0. So kind of a bimodal distribution. Right. 
And in fact, I think this one and this one help illustrate that there's in fact something that floats at about 2.0 and something that's about maybe 2.8. 10 to the 2.8, etc. Yeah. Sorry, 10 yeah. to the 2.8. Hmm. One of these days we'll get that y axis fixed again. Yep. Hmm. That's super cool. I wonder, is there a difference in the popularity of packages across countries? Hmm. How would you want to approach that one? I would potentially want to open up, uh, for the moment, we'd have to open up two different tabs, I think. Mm. Okay. Um, and to and to search uh, both by uh, so let's filter to to geocode equals US and geocode does not equal US. That seems like the most obvious thing to do first. Okay. Um, and the breakdown instead of being on country code winds up being on package name. Right. So filter country code equals US. And breakdown by. Uh, it should be a derived column. Is it called gem name? Gem, yep, downloaded gem name. Uh, I can get rid of that too. Oh. Eh, whatever. It's, It'll actually no help harm. cue us to remember what window we're looking at. I sometimes leave those extra fields in there. All right, and while we're at it, the other thing we'll need to filter is geo country code is not equal to US if we can get that query running as well. Sure. Wait, aren't I going to melt down the servers by running two different queries at once? Nah, be fine. Stop. Joe. You can do it. Okay, there's no excuse for this except to get my laptop fans. Yep. Toasty. I will uh, take my laptop off of the <laughs> <laughs> off of the other laptop just to uh, get it to to be slightly less toasty. There we go. Not your city. Hmm. This is doing. This is why we test. This is why we test in production before we uh, actually run for real. Oh, okay. Deirdre's pointing out that we're not very loud. If we lean in a little bit to the mic, it'll be better. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, this mic seems to. Okay, so we filtered is and is not US. Yep, so back to the is US. Oh, okay. Looks well, like there's a uh, things that aren't gems, which is by far the most popular thing to send. Hmm. Okay, we can knock that out. Okay, that works. Filter download gem name does not exist. Ta da! Oh, wait, oh, wait. Starting last week, I've started getting this one wrong every time. Download a gem name. Exists. That'll be better. Okay, cool. And we should do the same to the other query we're running. And probably, given the laptop struggling a little bit, uh, close some of the other things that we're not using, like that one there. Sure. Poor, poor laptop. It turns out that streaming is very, very intensive. Uh, although we haven't dropped any frames yet, which is good. So it's just the browser is a little slow. Okay. That should hopefully be a lot better. Yep. Downloaded gem name. Exists. There. That should be much better. And oh, this is going to be high combinatorial because we did not US by download gem. Oh, name. oh yeah, we got to we got to take that out. Yep. Well, we should cut out the uh, geo country code breakdown is the critical yep. one. Yep. Okay, that's why this one was lagging so much. It we're asking for a lot of different combinations. Yeah, and it turns out when you do ask for a lot of different combinations and have to keep track of all of them. It is a little slower. Mm. All right, but for the US case, what do we see? We see Ruby Gems, AWS SDK core, to no one's surprise, mm. even not from within AWS. Followed by Bundler. Hey, AWS partitions. 
Seems that AWS is really popular. Who knew? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And what's that big spike up there? Spike up there? Yeah. I don't know. Let's hover over yeah. it and see what happens. Ah, there it's AWS SDK core, but I saw, I swear I saw one of the other lines. Spike. See that blue one there too? Oh, AWS SDK Redshift? Is that what that is? Uh, no, that, that's like, further. Peri there's like a periwinkle-ish one. What happens if we just zoom in? Can we zoom in on that? Why don't we just sure. zoom in on that? Because that seems easier than uh, monkeying around. Mm -hmm. I like it. Okay. And I'll rerun to get higher resolution data there. Oh, right. I forgot that we could do that. That's cool. Learn something every day. There you go. Hmm. That's interesting. There was like this massive surge in interest for... There's a massive surge of some sort, right? It could be interest. Um, any chance that it could be like, this is when their cache refreshes or something like that? Oh, maybe they push a new package and then suddenly everything is, hmm. So in that case, we should ask if there is a connection between the packages that did make that spike and ones that didn't. See, RubyGems was not affected, but all of the AWS things spiked at the same time. Do you see that? Yeah. Hmm. Cool. That makes me ask the question, how much of RubyGems is AW is people fetching the AWS SDK and how much is not? Like, that seems like a new query to start over with regardless of country, but let's look at the other countries too, sure. outside of the US, because the world outside the US exists too. Uh, I don't know, at 145 it was still getting really excited about uh, AWS actually. Yeah, sure was. There you go, here's an entire pack of AWS. Yep. Wow. Yep. Redshift, the... Alexa, workspaces, resources. Hmm. That's actually really cool. 145 was the AWS party. Okay. So <laughs> let's go and yeah. have and have and have a look at how much is prefixed with AWS versus how much doesn't start with AWS. Because we do partial string matching, right? So this, right, yeah. this should be easy enough. And so get rid of that. And now the laptop will struggle less. So not broken down by country. Yeah. Uh, still broken down by downloaded gem name. And so let's find out. Hmm, we kind of almost need a derived column for this though, don't we? To say is AWS or is not AWS. Well, that'd be nice. Um, are you sure you don't have permissions to create a derived column? Because I swear I'm seeing create de derived column in your breakdown uh, box. What happens when you... I think you have to pseudo in. Okay, well, there's nothing stopping us from doing that aside from, from a two-factor uh, auth, so... Let's just speed up the query builder real quick. Yeah, okay, much better. So create der derived column. That seems to work, does oh, it? Okay, so, cool. so let's say... I'm delighted to be wrong. Oh, wait, uh, the gem name is also, in fact, uh, the gem name is also derived column, and we don't currently do derived columns of derived columns. So let's oh. look at the spec of downloaded gem name. How is that derived? Ooh, regex. Okay, Everybody that's fine. Loves regexes. That's fine. We can nest it. So. Okay. So. So uh, let's let me look up the query language. Calculate with derived columns. Well, uh, here. Derived column reference. Uh, starts with. It just starts with. And it's the expression, comma, and then AWS? Yep. AWS dash, I think. Okay. Uh, starts underscore with. Ah, thank you. This is why pair programming matters. Yep. You wind up catching a lot of your, your silly things. And unfortunately, none of those are great tests. If not, we can delete it and try no. again. It's fine. Oh, no. I just spent like... Um, yeah. Could not find. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I you might have to go to permissions. Okay. Well. Then instead, what I'll at least do. Download a gem name. Start with AWS. Oh, and then we're just going to do the inverse. 
Right, so... So we had 45,000 in this time window that started with AWS, whereas in the previous case... Did it not start with AWS? Yeah, again, this is a thing that's made much easier with Drive Columns. So, millions. Oh, no, that's not that's not correct. Download gem name could be not populated, right? So it does not start with oh, right. is insufficient. You're right. Downloaded gem name. Exists. Yeah, good point. A yep. uh, good reminder of the importance of the non-rectangular tables, of dealing with the non-rectangular tables, right? Okay. Not all columns are populated. Okay, now that seems right. So 129,000 versus... 45,000. 45,000. So we're looking at basically, what, a quarter of the traffic is related to AWS gems? Right. Wow. Okay. So let's... I want to learn a little bit more about this exciting spike that happened at 145. Let's do a vertical bubble up here. Hmm. Rather than looking only at a range of latencies, we're just looking at everything. Mm-hmm in that time range versus everything outside that time range. Yeah. Oh, so it's just three different users all downloading. So, GeoCity is... Probably Ashburn? No, oh, Portland. Portland. Hmm. Someone in Portland got very excited about... The Seattle Data Center. They were... Right, otherwise these look like the rest of everything else. Um, slightly yeah. more... They're a little more likely to have 304s. Yeah. Um, time elapsed is not too different. Log time, right? Some of them a little bit quicker, otherwise the same. And it's not one person. There's a whole ton of different client IPs. No, it's a ton of different client IPs, w but within one city. So is it that like a package gets uploaded and sent a little, and a whole bunch of systems? decide to auto-update themselves? I don't know. Well, uh, how would we figure that out? I guess one way we could figure it out is to look at the command lines, right? Like, mm. wonder what happens if we break down by request. Yeah, let's have a look at that. Or I thought the request agent had the uh, command that was being run in it somewhere. Scroll down. Okay, we no. may have to get some of the lower cardinality ones, or lo lower count ones. Huh. It's kind of funky. To, I mean, I guess at this point we're getting close to like individual behavior, which is why the patterns look so different from each other. Yeah, although it's kind of cool that... Oh. Again... And here's our good friend, you know, this particular one, who is not otherwise standing out, but for this particular case, pops way the heck out. Hmm. Yeah, okay, so maybe it's... But then why is it multiple different IP addresses if it's one Could it be like agent? one data center? Oh, yeah, you're right. It could be someone running a command across multiple different uh, machines right. using Chef or something. Yeah, okay, that's, yeah, so lo if you're that's logical. So if you're looking at like a Chef run or something... So I guess one thing we could do is pop out, though. We're looking yeah. at, like, a few-minute period. Let's look at an eight-hour range. Yeah, we're keeping... Yeah, we're within 11 hours. That's fine. Right. We're keeping 11 hours of this, so eight hours should be fine. It'll take a little longer to run. Yes. Analyzing a lot more data. Mm -hmm. We were looking at two hours before, which is pretty speedy, but... Okay. So, no, that, so it's not, so there are spikes from time to time, and they're not uniformly that particular service. Yes, yeah. yeah, so it's probably just one particular, mm -hmm. it's one particular use, set of, rolling set of different users who are each using the same version of Ruby gems potentially across multiple machines. Uh, you might right. need to rerun the query. Yeah. Get nice and tight, but yeah. Interesting. So is this the signa So is this the signature of what data centers look like? Uh, one particular version of things doing a whole bunch of queries all at once. Yeah, that that or could be it. This is what, or I guess this is what Chef looks like. Yeah, that could be what mm. Chef looks like. 
Any guesses what the bounciness here might indicate? Uh, maybe multiple different commands being run. Uh, mm. Let's. Can we zoom in on just that one? Sure. So let's look at that, and then let's break down by the client IP hash. So we can find out how many different ones it is. Yeah. Oh yeah. Look at that. Look at that. So. Well, yeah, that's that's someone that's someone automating. Doing although, the by same the way, thing over and over. this IP hits 5,000 times. Yep. This IP hits three. Hmm. Maybe they have some kind of caching. Maybe they have their own internal caching. Oh, interesting. Yeah. There's slightly different patterns there. Yep. So let's go back to our good uh, to our friend the gem name. Yep. And again, we're looking only at AWS gems, by the way. Down oh, to gem name starts point. with. Oh, but that makes sense, right? The first thing you do when you bootstrap a server on AWS, mm. you download the AWS CLI Ruby right. package. Oh, cool. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we're seeing is looks like essentially 260 servers that are run it started from one AMI right. all starting up, updating their AWS CLI. So in fact, that behavior of multiple spikes. That to me sounds like an auto scaling group starting up with like oh, 50 instances nice. and being like, oh crap, there's not enough. Okay, 60 instances, 70 instances until you oh, get all the way. Fun, I love that. Yeah. Okay. That was cool. so cool, right? Like, this this is the kind of thing that happens when you look at your data. Right. And when you can look across all these different dimensions at once and just slice them by these arbitrary weird things. <laughs> so if we believe that AWS is how someone's day starts, then I think I feel obligated to like jump back to this other one with does not start with AWS and see what that world looks like. And the other question that I have is what hap what does that person do after they download the AWS oh, gems? That's uh, a great point. Let's go back to that. Because after all, we have this... Uh, so, let's, so let's pick one of those clients. Okay. Oh, and you're going to follow it, almost like tracing, is except for without tracing. Right. Is it worth following on a specific IP address? Or a specific IP hash in this case? Sure. Uh, let's not take the 20. Let's take the ones, not take the ones without down, a downloaded gem name. Keep on going. OK, so oh, we have, I didn't realize this. OK, let's take that one, uh, Delta Echo 3. There? So, yep, filter for equals. Actually, I get to do only show me events in this group, which applies filters across the whole row. Oh, yeah, but that'll also set download gem name equals yeah, ADOS yeah. SDK core. So now we right. want to find out what else did they do. Yeah, and in fact, I'll take. OK, so you did a bunch of stuff, but what did they actually do? Huh. Why are they fetching? Why is the same IP fetching AWS SDK core 58 times, though? And then 29 times for these. Yeah. 29 and 58 are suspiciously similar. Yeah. And that one of them Factor is... Factor of two. Yeah, exactly. So we're just fetching all of... Did we apply the filter of a equals AWS SDK? Let's filter for... No, we didn't. No, we because... didn't. Okay. So they are, in fact, only pulling AWS. I think so. Yeah, that, se that seems right. Okay, in that case... I feel obligated to, like, for the stuff that they pull that is not <laughs> AWS, what are they doing? Yep, sure, that'll work. I bet it's pulling dependencies. It has to be pulling dependencies. Yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Dependencies for AWS SDK Core. Oh, for nope, but JMES path is not. Any guesses what a JMES path is? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. Okay. JMES path is a query language for JSON. So oh. it's a method of, it's like JQ. Okay. Oh, interesting. Hmm. Well, and I want to follow that rabbit hole if you don't mind. Sure, so let's go. go for it. You're let's going to find out who else uses it. Let's go find out what the world of people touching So, I mean, we can sort of see this line wiggling along. I guess I don't yet know what to do. 
with this factoid. So that means someone has expressed the intention to download that package and all of its transitive dependencies, right? Right. Uh, you probably want to break down, yeah? Yeah, let's break that down instead. So if we group it by an IP hash, we can find out how many distinct IPs are interested in this, which mm -hmm. is... Why are people repeatedly pulling this? That's what makes no sense to me. Like, I understand why one IP pulls it once and then goes away. Hmm. This is why caching strategies exist. It is interesting that it comes very burstably. Yeah. Each IP address that pulls it, or that does this request, except this one, does a whole series all at once. Uh, we can count distinct, right? I think there's a count distinct. Oh yeah, totally. Okay, let's let's count distinct. Okay. And we'll need to remove right. the breakdown. Distinct of client IP hash, remove the breakdown, because otherwise it'll always evaluate to one. Oh, we're also only looking at a four minute period. Yep. Again. That's true. So let's look at two hours, thirty minutes. Uh, okay, that's fine. Just to keep within the fast query window, things are a little faster there. So What's this telling us? One thing it's telling us is because the top and bottom lines aren't quite the same, right? This spike here, for example, is noticeably bigger than that spike. Mm. That's saying that there's a fair number of instances where... By the way, the for some reason this got reset. Oh. Like, it's... Sorry about that. Hi, My head is getting cut off. There we go. Oh, okay. Okay, I think it's better. Podcast adventures with... Or, uh, Twitch adventures with people of diff varying, diff uh, varying heights. I was joking, we should have gotten me an Apple box to stand on before we started this. <laughs> Is it the uh, new hip version of milk crates? <laughs> um. Hmm. I don't know that I'm... You would have to change the granularity to get an idea of the total popularity over like two hours, right? You, you would have to, uh, uh, so instead of five I... seconds, like you really don't want to... So yeah. let's make it nice and chunky here. Yeah, that's better. Okay. So it's being downloaded at a rate of about 45 distinct IPs per 10 minutes, so about one every 15 seconds. But 10 times that for raw count, which means that each of those is responsible for 10-ish. Yep. So whatever our mental yeah. model of how these works is, it's wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder why it's repeatedly being called multiple times. Like, you would think that it would cache the results or something. I don't know. Yeah, honestly, I don't work with Ruby in my day-to-day -day life as much. I mean, I... Let, so actually, keep here's, to draw. here's an idea. Yes. For this, for this URL, right, mm -hmm. let's... Let's go follow one one client IP and okay. let's look at the raw data to see what's what it's requesting. Maybe it's doing sure. a head before it's doing a get. Okay. Right? Like that's that's a fairly common pattern, right? When you use an API endpoint, you don't right. necessarily want to. Oh, so we should at least break down by what was the uh, command or pro not protocol uh... request. Thank. Yep, yeah, it's request. So yeah, even when we're doing this, uh, you know, the filters and the count distinct. No, they're all gets. Hmm. There is literally one head one command. One lonely head command. <laughs> Which almost sounds to me like somebody seeing that things aren't working, curling or something. <laughs> yeah, almost certainly. Okay, so <clears throat> so if it's not distinct on request, so let's let's find one example. Sure. Uh, one example IP. Yep. All right. Yes, I know. I'm sorry. Oh, good. It it stops you from doing this silly thing, which is good. Yes. Okay. So let's look at this one that ran it 15,000 times. Like, is, is something different about each of these times? 1,500, fortunately, but still. Oh, 1,500, yep. So, set okay, equals, so we'll do that. and then let's look at some raw data. Yeah. It's a shame we couldn't show off traces in this data set, because that would have been cool, but oh well. We'll find another data set, do this some other way. So is it literally, it's, it's repeatedly hitting the cache, and successfully hitting the cache. Right. The same request header size. Mm -hmm. Same request. Same service ID, same URL. Same. And, and it's pulling it like multiple times per second, pulling it like, like wow. that cannot be a human pattern. 
No, no, that definitely. Can't be a isn't. human pattern. That's. Is there a bug in Ruby Gem? Is there a bug in the Ruby Gem's client that's causing it to repeatedly fetch the same thing? I don't know. That's really interesting. Right. right. It looks like it's pulling back the same. There you go. Yeah, it's getting a two hundred seventy-one byte response. And the good news is Fastly takes care of this for us, right? Like Fastly right. means that it doesn't have to respond multiple times. But that's at the same time, like it's. Is it getting an H two hundred or a three hundred four? What what's the response code? Uh, uh, we we must have the H two P status, do we not? There is. Yeah. So it's actually. It's not even getting content and modified. It's sending those same bytes over and over. Mm. That, that doesn't seem right. Like that seems like a a waste of resources. You'd you'd think that the client would be smarter or or, or something. Right. I mean, it's still tiny. It's only a couple hundred bytes, but still. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> well, the interesting things you discover when you look into your data. So we have about nine minutes left. Um, are there any uh, viewer requests, any questions, or should we do one more deep dive in exploration? And there's usually about a five to 10 second delay, so we'll have to wait for that question to percolate down. And meanwhile, let's reset the view. You probably want to set it to no longer be 10 minute interval. So once we rerun it. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Thanks for the reminder. I wish we showed, in addition to last two hours, like last two hours at 10 minutes or last two hours at one minute. You're totally right. That'd be great and fairly easy. Yeah, yeah. That's, that sounds like a trivial change list. Yeah. Okay, we can, do, we can do it real fast afterwards. <laughs> I want to see if there anything was popping out with response body size. But I'm curious what the slowest gems are, right? We can find out what the slowest gems are. Oh. Where downloaded gem exists, right? So then we then we just bubble up on the slow ones and we'll get all of the slow gem names. Right. Because that might be super interesting. Oh, interesting, by the way. For the gem exists. Yep. There's this like whole stripe of gems that are incredibly fast to serve. Maybe they're four no, or fours. No, these are sizes. Oh, tiny gems. But you're right. We should be splitting out the stat. We should be filtering to status equals two hundred, right? Yep. We dropped out of the fast query window. The fast query window is now one hour because okay. apparently people are like <laughs> modifying a bunch of code or whatever. Okay, uh, cool. So do you so, want to do the bubble up? Yeah. So you're suggesting that we do that on? Yeah, like kind of those those outliers. Yep. In particular, I'm interested in a couple of things, right? Like which gem names pop out, mm -hmm. and also do they have a different? Uh, do they have a different shape of their response body size, right? right? I think that that's going to be really interesting to look at. To see, is it just taking longer because it's downloading larger things, or is there some kind of performance regression type thing going on? All right. I well. think it's just the time run flows differently when you're uh, aware that everybody's watching you. There you go, download gem name. Nokogiri, what's Nokogiri? Oh, it's a uh, HTML, HTML, XML, Sax, and Reader parser. Interesting. And it is apparently, yep. And so that's where... It's, it's a good chunk of it, but it's not all of it. Right, and then after that we have Metasploit and JRuby jars. Okay. Well, let's yeah. exclude that one slow client ID. Like, maybe there's just something wrong with that, <clears throat> with, with that IP. So Good point. If we exclude that and rerun the bubble up, what happens? Like, I'm interested in not just, yeah. like, what for, fetch from one very slow client was very... That's a great right, point, like, yeah. So I'm interested in kind of what's more systematically slow. So if that one person was ruining us with no Kugiri... Yeah, then we'd want to know that, but presumably it's but something else. But once we know it, we want to know, yeah, what, the, what everybody else is doing. 
so much nicer to like not have to futz between different dashboards. This would have been like a nightmare to do uh, from my previous time at Google. Okay, much more distributed range of client IPs. Still, one slow Nokogiri. Yeah. Now it's 37% of our sample. Interesting. Oh, okay. So there's one bad client and one bad gem that are contributing to a majority of this of this phenomenon. So what else besides Nokogiri is going on? Um, well, let's again knock out Nokogiri. Okay. Although I'm curious to dive into that too later. In our copious free time. Yeah, in our copious free time. Uh, or we'll leave it for you know other for other adventurers, because all this I want to be very clear. Go you can to, just do. Yeah, go to play.honeycomb.io. Click on the Ruby Gems button. Go do precisely what we did, but do it better. Learn more interesting things. And share with us. Like tweet it, tweet at us. Would be really interesting to find out. Totally. Um, at Liz the Grayer, at Danielle Fisher, or at Honeycomb.io. Yeah. Either way, all of those reach us. Okay, now we see. Okay, so now it's actually a fairly broad variety of slow gems. And a fairly fr broad variety, but right, like it sounds like if the Ruby Gems folks wanted to improve like the performance, it sounds like there are. Ooh, look at that! Look at the uh, response. Look at the response body size. It's the larger gems. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at um, if we go back yeah. and we group by uh, put Nokogiri back in there. I'm curious what Nokogiri's uh, oh, response so body size is. No Kogiri. Yep. Wondering, is it just some massive package? Now, are we going to get the nice horizontal line that indicates the consistency? Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And it's uh, se 7, 10 to, the, 10 to the 7 Yeah. in size. Compared to the other ones, what were the other ones? Oh, you're seeing things in the, like, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4, 5 okay, range. Okay, so it's just a much larger package. There's nothing to be done about it, then. It's not It's right. not like RubyGems is, is deliberately, like, the database right. is being slow or something. No, go find the package maintainer and make them refactor. Maybe it's their test suites. I bet, like, if you're an oh. HTML parser, like, I don't think it's necessarily that it needs a lot of code to do. I bet it's their test suites that are, that are clogging it up. Oh, interesting. Okay. But that's an exercise left to the reader. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, that was a fun experiment. I would definitely do that again. Yeah, I think we learned a couple things. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, and thanks for the folks who watched. And we'll actually put this up on YouTube or on Vimeo afterwards so other people can enjoy it too. Excellent. Thanks so much.